Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. And also by the Mama Nurture Prenatal Yoga School. Learn to teach fertility yoga, prenatal, postnatal, and baby and me yoga with confidence. To find out more about our online or in-person trainings, visit mamanurture.ca. And don't forget, we spell mama, M-A-M-A, so that's mamanurture.ca. Welcome, Connected Yoga Teachers, to episode 136 of the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I'm a mom of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant who works for yoga teachers. And this podcast, it was created for you so that you can connect to information and inspiration every single week and feel supported as you navigate being both a yoga teacher and an entrepreneur. I know how isolating and how challenging the days can be when you are a business owner and you are doing your best to take yoga out into your community. In this episode today, we're looking at a really specific niche in yoga, teaching yoga to teens and tweens. If you have been listening to this podcast for a while, I'm sure you're familiar with my passion for finding your niche and working in that space, which is why I'm so excited to have Dr. Karen Pasco on today to talk about her niche in working with younger students. Tweens and teenagers, let's face it, they can sometimes be a difficult audience to reach. They are changing physically, mentally, and emotionally, and that comes with a whole different set of challenges. As I said, and as many of you know, I am a mom of three. My kids are now 21, 16, and 13, which means at one point, they were all teenagers, not that long ago. And I feel like my oldest really trained me. I feel like I did not know what I was in for with a teenager. All of my kids over the years at some point have attended a yoga class. (laughs) And sometimes they joke about how this was more my idea than their idea. But they still come home. Even last night, my 21-year-old came home and said, Mom, can you do your voodoo stuff on me? My neck is sore. I know that yoga helps me as a mom, and I see the difference it can make in anyone at any age. In this interview, Karen reveals what got her interested in teaching to tweens and teens and how she discovered her niche. We dive into how classes for this age are different from kids yoga and then also yoga for adults. Karen also shares some of her techniques to help connect and communicate with her students, as well as some things to be aware of when teaching this unique age group. I learned a lot from Karen. If you teach teens and tweens already, or if you're interested in niching down and focusing in on this age group, or if you have teens or preteens, I think that you are going to love this episode and the tools that Karen offers. All of our show notes and links are ready for you at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 136. There you can find anything that we're talking about as well as clickable timestamps. I love those. Before we meet Karen, I have a review here that I wanted to read. It's from Hottie from the United States. I'm curious, did you pick your own username and what made you choose the name Hottie? Anyway, (laughs) it's a great review. Let me read it. It's another good one, Pinterest. It's a five-star review and Hottie from the United States says, The Pinterest episode was great. I never really thought about focusing on it. However, I use it all the time. Thanks again for another great episode. I listen to all of them. Thank you so much for taking the time to leave a review. I hope you're okay that I was asking questions about your username. (laughs) If you're looking for that episode, it is episode 113 with Kate All, and it was all about how to use Pinterest to promote your yoga. If you have not left us a review yet, that is really one of the best gift of thanks that you can give a podcaster. And if you leave a review on iTunes or on our Facebook page, we try and grab them all and read them out at some point on the podcast. It's fun to have someone say, hey, especially when your name is Hottie. Hey, Hottie. (laughs) Also, I want us to hear our hot tip of the week from Schedulicity. Let's have a listen to that.
Hey, Connected Yoga Teachers, this is Shayna with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Successful full-time yoga teachers have a lot to deal with before they even hit the mat. Marketing, processing and tracking payments, checking people in and trying to make sure they all fit, accounting, keeping up with email correspondence and social media campaigns, You may feel like you need a personal assistant, or maybe you just need Schedulicity. You've spent hundreds of hours learning how to teach others to manage the complexities of their minds and bodies. Let Schedulicity manage the complexities of your online scheduling and marketing. You deserve a few hours to yourself. Thank you so much, Team Schedulicity. I really was appreciating you and your reports today when I wanted to just make a list of everyone who I've worked with in 2019. I like to reflect back and see all of the yoga teachers that I have met with one-on-one. Alrighty, Connected Yoga Teachers, let's dive into this. Let's meet Dr. Karen Pasco, who is a licensed psychologist, certified personal trainer, certified therapeutic yoga teacher, and an experienced registered yoga teacher with Yoga Alliance. Karen began teaching yoga in 1996 and has been using a mind-body approach in treating conditions such as mental illness and substance dependency throughout her career. In 2015, Karen launched the Mind Body Life Transformation Center, which represents her personal dream to truly integrate the intertwining practices of mind and body therapies and offer them together in a safe space. She offers services such as yoga classes, therapy, and wellness sessions, as well as classes, parties, and summer camps, specially targeted at teens and tweens. Let's dive in and meet Karen. Welcome, Karen, to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. Thank you. It's amazing to have you here today. I'm super excited because we get a lot of questions from yoga teachers about how do I teach to a teenage group of students, yes. uh, yoga students. And But before we dive into that, I want to find out sort of what is your yoga journey? Like how did your yoga get started and how did it bring you to where you are now and what you do now? Sure. Um, so I was working at a fitness center as a personal trainer and I loved fitness and always had because I knew the advantage that uh, fitness had on mental health. And so the original plan was to combine those two. I was uh, going to school for psychology and to become a counselor and um, getting a kind of minor in exercise science. And then at this uh, fitness club, and this was back in 1996, the owner came to me and he said, hey, there's this new thing called yoga that's coming into the clubs and you need to teach it. And my first response was, I'm not flexible. I can't do that. Um, And he had one person come in from the community and this was in Cleveland, Ohio. So it wasn't, um, it really hadn't reached there yet. So there was one person came in, taught one class and it was so hard for me to do, I was sold. And so I thought, this is amazing. And I got a book and I got a uh, VHS cassette and I taught myself how to teach yoga. And I taught. Within two weeks, I was teaching a class and uh, I was so in love with it. And I was feeling so amazing that I just got every resource I could and just kept going Um, and teaching and getting feedback and learning more and more and more. And then every training I could find, I went to. Um, and it kind of took over what I thought would be my exercise, my fitness and psychology, uh, because the yoga merged them both together. And so that was back in 1996. And since then I've done numerous trainings and I've taught, um, all those years in, in different places. And, um, and then let's see, in 2015, I opened my own business. So now I own a business called the Mind Body Life Transformation Center. And this is a place to do mind body work. And so I just put all these classes on the schedule for the community. And this is a big, um, I'm in Highland Ranch, Colorado. So this is a very big family oriented place. And I knew I had to offer things for kids and tweens and teens. And the response was amazing. And so now um, my teen tween stuff fills up. It sells out. Um, We need more of it. And I'm loving it. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that like journey. And I love how it started with, you know, VHS tapes. and Oh, yes. Back in 96. (laughs) That's fantastic. So 
tell us, uh, what do you think is the biggest difference then between an adult class and a tween or teen yoga class? Uh, I think there's a few differences, but uh, kind of just looking at it, it would be format. Uh, either you go into an adult class and the teacher centers you and just you you just launch and hopefully she has some intention set for the class so it's structured really well and um, it's very meaningful. And in the tween and teen classes, you have to have these pauses to engage and re-engage because they don't have the attention span for that. Um, it needs to be more of a community-oriented experience. So in the adult classes, usually um, everybody's facing the same direction. And they're usually facing where the instructor is, especially if the instructor leads the class. And there's not a lot of interaction. And in the tween and teen classes, what works better is a circle. So that they're looking, everybody's looking at everybody. And so it's more of this um, kind of uh, cohesive, we're doing this together experience. And then there's pauses. So we might do a centering exercise and then we pause and we have a bit of a chat and we talk about what we're going to do next. And then we do another section. Um, maybe some sun salutations and maybe building in some warrior sequences into that. And then you stop and then you have a balanced time. And, you know, so it's just a little bit more interactive in that way. And the younger they are, the more it has to be. With my older teens, they can come into the adult classes and just, you know, tune out and do their own thing. But um, I would say not until about 15 or 16. Younger than that, you, you need that interactive piece. Okay. That's amazing. I love this. I love even the class layout is different, this circle versus the way we set up a class. That makes a lot of sense. So let's just clarify, what is the age that you consider a tween? And then what do you consider teen? So I consider the tweens and I call the uh, the tween classes, the nine to 12 year olds. Okay. Um, and they group together really well. That's basically fourth through sixth grade. Right. Um, and sixth grade is a very popular age around here for exploring yoga. And so then I also do um, middle school and I call them teenagers, but it's really 12 to 14 years old um, and basically sixth, seventh and eighth grade. They seem to group really well together. And then as soon as they hit high school, um, I have a class that's just for 13 to 18 year olds, um, but I get uh, rarely get anybody over 15. Right. Because okay. they, the, other, the 16 and up, they're in the adult classes. They're, they really can just move into the adult classes. They can understand the concepts. They can stay with the pace. They can stay with kind of the independent nature of it, that they're doing their practice in that class. Um, yeah. So what I call the teens really is like a 12 to 15, I guess. Right. Okay. And then how does that student differ? Like I'm, I live with two teenagers right now yeah. <laughs> and I have a 21 year old. And so it's, it's a whole different um, element, you know, from having little kids and then they're teenagers. Here's an example. I know that my kids and their friends all have a cell phone. So mm -hmm. how do you sort of see this student coming in and what are some of their differences as opposed to the adult students that we would see? I think it's, I mean, it, I can't group them all that way because each student does approach it a bit different. Um, but in, in different seasons too, you know, it's so cool when they come in in the school year and they stop in the front and they take off their shoes and they turn their phone off and they put it in their shoes and they don't even... and they don't even move it into the yoga room. They really want to detach. Right. And so I think that looks a little bit more adult-like. Right. And then there's the students that, um, you know, they want to bring the phone in. Uh, if I take a picture or something, they all, like everybody's going for their phone to get a picture too. You know, they're still kind of attached like that um, to their devices and have a little diff more difficult time detaching or just really not interested totally in detaching. They don't feel the need. Um, for it, but the older teens, um, yeah, they are, they're happy to let go of that. And that's why I said about 16 and up, they kind of look more like you're an adult student. Right. They're seeking more of the same thing, just to detach, to have an hour. They don't really care as much about taking care of their bodies in that way that adults might, um, but they do want to take care of their minds. They want peace. Yeah. Okay. And so what does it feel like, like what 
Who signs a nine-year-old up for yoga then at the tween age? (laughs) Um, Pretty much 17 and under, it's all parents. Right. And, um, And the nines, I think they're a little bit maybe more motivated because of just how it is. You know, they love the clothes. They love their yoga clothes, especially the girls. And so they, or their friend went to a yoga class, so they want to do it too, that kind of thing. So they're, you know, I just got an email from a mom that um, she, her daughter wants to come to my camp. My, I do a yoga camp in the summer um, because her friends are coming, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So it wasn't the mom, it was the daughter. But um, a lot of times I get calls from parents that say, I want to sign my child up and they, it's a teenager. And so it's still motivated that way by the parents. And I get these teens that come and they're like, I don't know why I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) So how do you deal with that then when kids are coming in and they, it wasn't really their idea, their parents signed them up? Um, I mean, you're, you do yoga. So, you know, it's such an amazing experience. You cannot deny when you practice the way you feel. And so certainly with youth, um, more than adults for me, those pauses are opportunities for integration. How do you feel? What are you noticing that's happening in your mind and your emotions and your body, that kind of thing from time to time. So they're really taking those opportunities to notice what's happening from the yoga and starting to own it in that way. Because one of my goals for that age is empowerment. I feel that yoga teaches so many skills for emotional regulation, self-regulation, mindfulness, detachment, all these amazing things. And we want the youth to experience that for themselves because when they know they have that capacity, I didn't do that for them. They did that through the work that they did in the practice. It's always there and they can use that at any time. They feel empowered. They don't feel so vulnerable to everything outside of them in school, all that's happening just in their world and that kind of thing. So those opportunities for integration so they can start to feel like, well, yeah, yoga is kind of cool. I, it made me feel this way. Now I have these strategies. If I need them, I know how to relax. I know how to let go, those kinds of things. So then they're a little mo- more motivated to come back. Okay. That's amazing. What I wanted to ask you then is what does your class look like? I realize that every yoga teacher has a different way of putting a class together, but is there a difference between the way you put a tween class together versus a teen? And can you kind of walk us through what the structure of both of those is? Mm -hmm. So with my tweens, which is my nine to 12 year olds, it's a 45 minute class. That seems to be about the right amount of time. The, my more advanced students, because I have some students that have been practicing with me for three years now. And so I could definitely stretch them out to the 60 minute and they do dabble every once in a while coming with their parents or something to the adult classes. But um, 45 minutes, we still, we take about three minutes to get centered um, prior to that, especially when there's new students, we take a moment to just go around and say names and kind of something, um, random, you know, your name and your favorite ice cream, you know, something like that, because it's that cohesiveness that's going to make it, uh, more interesting for them. And so we want that bonding piece to move in. Um, and so then a little bit of centering, and then we start right out, especially in the school year when the classes are after school because they've had that expectation of being formal and sitting still and following this plan. And you you want the yoga practice to feel very free for them and uh, creative in some ways. And so we do um, get into movement pretty quick for those ages where we set with sun salutations, um, taking deep, huge breaths, that kind of thing. And then kind of the excess energies, the leaky energy is a little bit uh, less. And then we can move into warriors and we do a lot of balance work and take the time to integrate. And we set up the younger they are. And especially when there's boys in the class, we do challenges with the balance because that's very appealing Um, and a bit of a competitive spirit sometimes. But also with... uh, we have a student stand in the middle and in tree pose because remember we have a circle format and everybody dances around them crazy to try to distract them. <laughs> so they see how well they can center themselves and be detached. And it's a riot. They love it. They ask for it to be able to do that kind of thing. Then we move on. I mean, I think the elements are a bit of the same as the adult classes. So we do our warriors, we do our balances, um, we go into deeper stretches we then usually get our inversions in there and I always get the kids upside down and I talk to them about what's happening when they get that 
extra oxygen dump to their brain in a handstand. And we do pike handstands on the wall, those right angle handstands so that there's no concerns about the balance there. So they can really be in it and breathe in it and get that extra blood into their brains and stand up. And when we stand up, we always say, wish because it's like, it's washing out anything excess in the brain and everybody does it in gestures just like I do because it's funny. <laughs> and then, um, headstands, if they're interested, I always do support it. They want to do them in the middle of the room. Um, and that's usually where the conversation about this is not an ego driven practice. This is for your well being. We're not trying to look like superstars here, you know, so let's use the wall. Um, and then, um, some kind of closing cool down stretches. And by then, and especially after the inversions, because those are the single most calming pose that you can do. Um, I think adults feel that as well. Uh, it'll be silence after we get upside down. And so it's great to take into the cool down. And then um, I, I do somewhere between a two and five minute shavasana, kind of just reading the room at the time, um, I do a lot of guided meditations, you know, taking them places, they can see things in their minds, um, encouraging them to establish their own happy place and giving them some elements to find that and how they can use that uh, at other times in their life. I use the meditation um, opportunity in Shavasana to really teach how to meditate. So I do guided for them too, but in a way you can take yourself to this place because Again, I want so much of the yoga to be strategy for them, to, for it to be empowering that these, I'm teaching you, but these are your things. These are always available to you. You can use them as you need. And now you know the effect. Now you know what it feels like when you do this. So I would say the elements are all the same, you know, the pieces, kind of like a peak, you know, around balance poses and then taking it, it down. So it's not that different in that way. And the teen... The middle school teenagers is the same format, but less pauses. The older they get, the less you pause. You just right. kind of keep going. Um, and then my older teens, that's a, my 13 to 18 year olds, that's a 60 minute format. And that looks a lot like uh, an adult class, um, but we spend more time in inversions and arm balances. Because, okay. wow, you, if you get them building an arm balance and finding their strength and being able to do it, you've got someone that's going to come back and try again. Right. Oh, that's amazing. So I love how you said that you kind of shorten those pauses once they move up in age. Can you come back to the pauses and how like what those sort of look like. You gave a few examples. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so um, this is what it often looks like. We will, um, with my nine to 12 year olds, we'll get sun salutations in, then we'll start doing some warrior poses and maybe build short sequences, you know, kind of linking up warrior one, two, and three, something like that. And then um, doing that a little bit where I know, and I can see in their faces, they're getting a little physically taxed. Right. Those are challenging poses. So um, then we will maybe do a sun salutation and come down to crocodile, which is that pose where you lay on your belly and you turn your heels in and your toes out and you fold your arms underneath your chin. And so we're all in a circle. It looks like a slumber party. Right. And so we just have a moment where we just, you know, ah, oh, that felt great. I feel so relaxed right now. Or, you know, maybe they'll say something because in that practice, something came up emotionally and they just want to put words to it. And I think that's great. And I always let that go within a reasonable amount of time. Like this happened at school and um, I'm holding on to it. You know, they start to learn the language too that we, we say with this. Um, and so it's just a moment to share something. And, and, you know, the younger they are, it's that still like... Uh, the hands are always up in the air. Right. <laughs> right. Is Karen, I have a question. Okay. Hang on to your question. Um, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And so sometimes there's pauses for that. You know, we have to be kind of realistic with time and what we're trying to accomplish. And I say that like this too, with those ages, you know, let's get our yoga done first. Let's get this right. piece of our yoga done. And then we'll, we'll get to that question. So hang on to it. Um, and, or sometimes it's just a comment, but it's those, those are the pauses. That's what it looks like. We'll get in crocodile. We'll say something about how we feel. Someone might express something about their day and then we move on. Right. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Thank you for painting that picture for us. I also really appreciate that your intention is to empower this age group. I think it's really needed. I see how much pressure uh, tweens and teens are under like 
you know, that we have this whole like fitting in and and being and being themselves and all all of the things that go along with being a teenager on top of i think there are a lot of pressures you know through school different f- family like other people's expectations of what this age group is supposed to be doing and mm-hmm. yeah yeah and they you know i mean the teen years is when uh individual starts to develop emotional regulation and if they're not being taught strategy and skill for emotional regulation, they feel very vulnerable because their emotions are at the height of the capacity. And so I'll get a parent that will come in and talk about their um, their teenager, uh, for instance, something along the lines of, she just loses her mind. She just screams. She screams. She's so upset. And I'm like nodding. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a teenage brain happening. Um but then the youth in those moments, because the parents reflecting back, what is wrong with you? And they don't really feel that something's wrong, but that reflection back makes them feel that something's wrong with their emotions. They have then a strategy to regulate. They have a strategy to manage their emotions. They have a understanding of their emotions and something to do about it. Because if you ask them, um, some, or if you say to them something like, you got to calm down you've got to calm down. This is not that big of a deal. That is so dismissive, first of all. So I hope parents stop saying that, but um, <laughs> they'll say something like, I don't know how, I don't know what to do. I'm right. really upset. I don't know what to do. And then this gives them things to do. Very concrete, very mindful strategies that need nothing outside of them. And then that feels empowering right. because that is a very vulnerable state to feel out of control with your own emotions and not know what to do. And then right. have someone else having a difficulty with your emotional expression. It just makes it that much worse. You feel bad. Right. Oh yeah. That's so true. You know, there, we all know what it's like to have a bad moment or like maybe to say something or just be reacting to a situation and then to have someone say, Hey, your reaction is, is not okay with me. That just adds to it. So is there anything that you can offer in terms of because maybe there are parents of teens listening uh, or yoga teachers who really want to empower this age group. Um, Some of the tools that you teach, like what would be some of those so that they can then take them out and use them Mm -hmm. in those moments? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it would depend on what the thing is, but uh, breathing strategies. So uh, the breath of joy that uh, three sips of the inhale and a giant exhale through the mouth with a ha sound. So you're bringing up all the blocks to joy and then you're hawing them out um, and the energy goes up. Um, they're, yeah, the prana's flowing when you do that. And so when they have a really down day or they just feel overwhelmed um, in a heavy sense um, from something that went on, then they have that strategy and it, you just do it five times, three sips in, you know, through your nose, sip in, sip in, sip in, fill up your lungs and a giant exhale through your mouth. And they love that because it's quick. It's easy. I mean, they really can't do that in school. We kind of joke about the stuff that you can do in school, the stuff that you can't like, (laughs) can you ask your teacher, can I stand up? I need to get in a headstand right now. Um, my yoga teacher said I should, um, or then, uh, just teaching them how to breathe deep belly breathing, teaching them, um, the triangle breath, that, you know, where you inhale for a count of five, you hold for three, you exhale for seven, you know, that kind of thing that helps draw their focus um, in, um, helps them be less reactive out. It calms the nervous system because it's a longer exhale. Um, you can teach cocky breath, K-A-K-I, the beak breath, you know, where it's an inhale through your nose and then it's an exhale like you're whistling, but you don't whistle. So it's like a whistle face, a beak. Um, that's very calming, very cooling. So if someone's temper is getting hot or they're feeling very agitated, that's a nice one. Um, so a lot of pranayama um, meditation, uh, just even some standard mindfulness meditations, uh, imagining um, your thoughts are like clouds. They just float in and they float out off into the distance and you're just sitting with your breath, witnessing the thoughts. You're detaching and watching simply. Um, 
making space for emotion, you know, giving yourself an opportunity to value the emotions that came up, uh, that was probably accurate for whatever the situation is. So you just give a little, um, validity to that and, uh, sit with it and let it be for a moment. And then a couple deep breaths to wash it away. You know, I mean, there's so many things to do. And then there's the poses to, um, you know, you're feeling really anxious, um, just moving gently and mindfully with the breath through sun salutations, teaching that you're feeling uh, you have a presentation to do uh, mountain pose, you know, and really feeling the mountain pose and anchoring in, grounding, rooting, centering, you know, all those kinds of things. The list is endless. You know, and I mean, then- we all love yoga. So we know that <laughs> everything is magical and should be used all the time. <laughs> uh, so do you draw the parallel for students? It sounds like you do. Like you say, when you have a presentation, here's mountain pose. Do you do you do a pose or do a breath practice and then say, and this is good for, or do you just teach it and then they have it in their back pocket? I always integrate. I always offer. Um, and then the time, let's practice it. And then you tell me how it feels to you. You know, that kind of thing for an opportunity. But I am selling it a little bit in its intention. Um, this does this. Let's try this. And I say this um, to, I, I say this to my clients too, but uh, practice till you feel it. You know, practice mountain pose till it actually feels steady. Practice mountain pose till you feel rooted and grounded. Practice till you feel it. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Because I know they do. The, the yoga poses do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. It does. And it just takes a little while for the whole system to kind of catch up with what it's really available to do for you. And so practice, do you feel it? Do you then focus in on work mostly with tweens and teens in your practice as a psychologist or or is it all ages? Um, it's tween and up. So okay. I, I work with a lot of adults. And I've always worked with adults. Um, But for the last four years, um, my tween and teen population in my practice has increased uh, exponentially because it's so appealing to them um, from a therapy standpoint that they're not going to come in and just talk. Right. That is a nightmare scenario besides a few random students or youth that yeah, I want to go talk to someone. I mean, you almost never hear that. I can't right. wait to go talk to a stranger about <laughs> my difficulties. Um, but when you are saying um, you're going to go meet with this person and uh, she's going to help you with your anxiety and she's going to teach you some yoga stuff. Right. Okay, I can do that. You know, that sounds so much more appealing, especially to the boys. You know, the idea that they would come in for a traditional counseling is not appealing at all. Um, but that they're going to come in and we're going to move, you know, we're going to do some stuff and, um, get the negative energy out and the good in and yeah, conversation will unfold, but you don't sell that. Like it it just happens. And I always tell the parents, like, just tell them, like, just get them in for a private yoga session. Right. We'll take it from there. Yeah. We'll see where it goes because then the expectations are really what it's going to look like anyway. Um, and the opportunity for the therapy and the conversation that needs to happen is, is there, but it's yeah. not the lead. So it doesn't become a barrier. Do you do more of the yoga portion with teens and tweens than you do with adults or is it the same? Um, it really is a client to client kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm because I do use a lot with the adults. It, I, I have very few uh, tweens or teens that I see in the, the therapy side of this, the psychology side of this, um, that we do none. Right. Uh, where it's just talk therapy, cognitive behavioral kinds of things. I mean, because you just can't, because whatever they come in for, it's all mind body, right? Like the depression, anxiety, no matter what they're coming in for, it's in it's in their body as much as their mind. Their uh, physiology is having a response to, to the mental health condition. And since I am trained, I do, I just offer both. I, I mean, I just, I feel that it's appropriate to do that. Um, but I would say proportionate of time spent probably more with the yoga strategy and the practice with the youth and a bit more in conversation with the adults. Right. Uh, is there anything that you can think of for if there are yoga teachers listening who are being asked to teach teen yoga because you were saying it's really needed? There's more. Oh my goodness, yes. What 
tips do you have for them? If they're, if they've never taught a tween or teen yoga class, <laughs> lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> it is not going to be a great class to start. Um, it, yeah. So that, cause I think you get this grand idea of what this is going to look like and that everybody's going to be cooperative. And the interesting thing about the youth, the tweens and the teens, any day that they come in for the class, you don't know what you're getting. Adults are fairly consistent in their temperament and disposition. And you can pretty much guarantee that anytime an adult comes in, you're going to teach an adult. But when a tween teen comes in, one day you're going to get an adult and they want to take it very serious. And they want you to use all the Sanskrit words and make it super special. And then the next time they're asking, what games can we play? Right. Can we play musical mats? Can we play <laughs> yoga wave? Um, you know, that kind of thing. And you're, you've got a preschooler and you right. didn't expect that. And so you have to be super flexible. If you have a grand plan of what your class is, what you're offering, what your attention is for that day, what you're going to do to cultivate the intention and help them integrate with that, uh, keep in the back of your mind that you may completely uh, put that paper down and shift and just take care of what's in your room that day. Um, there are days when they have a standardized testing Oh yeah, in school and mm-hmm. they come in and uh, um, my kids go are in this community as well. So I always know what's going on in the schools. Um, that we hula hoop. That's how we start our yoga practice. We hula hoop, you know, just to get out that kind of rigidness of the testing that they endured that day yeah. um, and get playful and get the prana flowing that way. Nice. Um, so with teaching teens, don't have a big expectation. Um, plan for the flexibility that you're going to have to just be available for whatever's coming in. And um, I don't know if I already said this, but it the probably the biggest factor is it's got to be cool. I mean, you you have to be cool. You have to be cool. You The thing has to be cool. Um, probably the best thing that happened. I don't even know how it happened at the end of the year. Um, there's a new song. I'm not up with pop culture too great, but um, I don't know what was said, but somehow it triggered someone starting to sing Old Town Road. Yes. So quickly on my phone, I got it to play. Yeah. Old Town Road. Okay. Now I'm the coolest person in the world because now right. I've got this piped into a yoga studio here. Um, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So music choices. Um, sometimes they like the popular stuff. Sometimes they like something that they they wouldn't hear anywhere else because it makes then the yoga experience special and unique and different. Um, I get a lot of that feedback uh, from my students that they like my music, which is um, nothing like it's not uh, pop charts kind of stuff. You know, it's more ambient trance kinds okay. of things. Um, but again, with your group, when if you're going to teach yoga, teens yoga, yoga to teens or tweens, um, when you get your group going, ask for the feedback too. Right. You know what they want more of or less of. I mean, I wouldn't just do a blanket. Uh, what do you want class to look like? You know, that kind of thing. But um, do you want to hear more of this or do you want to move on to this? That kind of thing. I think you can get the feedback. Or a key student, um, especially one that's coming consistently, you know, just kind of pulling them aside at the end, like, hey, um, do you prefer that or should we try this? And they'll tell you, yeah, let's do that. That'd be way better. And so take their feedback. That's a good idea. So when you said you have to be cool. You have to be um, so cool. Now I live with two teenagers who know mm-hmm. that I am the most uncool person. Is that just because I'm their parent? Yeah, you're, okay. you're cool. You're cool. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> so you'd be cool to other, other parents, teenagers. Right. Yours, it, that's, that ship has sailed. It always has. But um, <laughs> I, I mean, and, and it sounds kind of weird, but you know, the, so again, the music, um, the environment, which I think is one of the reasons it's difficult when people are trying to teach in the schools, because you've got what you've got. And so you don't have this um, kind of sacred space. You can't necessarily create a room that has an ambiance to it. But I think if you are going to teach um, in kind of a less desi- desirable environment, then bring some props, um, bring some aromatherapy, Um, if you have eye pillows, bring them for everyone for Shavasana, you know, if you can do that and just bring a tissue, you know, to keep it kind of hygienic, um, get, you know, set up a little, like a kind of a meditation space or something, you know, even if you can't have fire candle, um, bring a, um, LED candle that's going to, you know, turn the lights or, you know, kind of change colors or something like make it cool. And even how you dress, you know, um, 
wearing yoga stuff has beads, you know, something that, I mean, don't fake it. You know, I mean, if this is authentic to the instructor, you know, have those things, you know, just bring a little the yoga uniqueness to it. Um, So props like aromatherapy and candles and lights and, you know, the music and just even how you look and kind of present all of it um, can add to the experience that it is something magical. It's something cool. It's something worth trying. Well, that's great. And so you mentioned if we, if we are teaching in schools, do you teach in schools or do you teach outside of? I don't, I have my own studio. I am, right. So, which is so convenient. I mean, I, I, I know I am in a luxury position here because I can control everything. Um, the lights, the temperature, the, you know, everything like that. Um, I've taught in other environments before where I'm, you know, kind of coming in with my bag and my, um, device to play music and that kind of stuff. So I know the difficulty of it. Um, but that's just a tip because it, it really is convenient in a lot of ways to bring the yoga to the students. Right. And a lot of times schools will allow that, um, to be brought in as a before school, which would be ideal. Oh my goodness. If we could get every kid to just take even 20 minutes to just move their bodies and connect with their breath and find peace in their minds. And then I don't know what kind of day could they have really, you know, it'd just be amazing. But, um, I think those environments it's needed more, but prepare in that way that you're, you're bringing some stuff that's going to create a space. So it doesn't feel like they're just at school in their gym or their library or whatever it would be. Oh, that's nice. And so then do you have any marketing tips for yoga teachers? Because you said that it is parents that are generally booking in. Like, what do you think is the most effective in terms of having people find out about your teen and tween yoga classes? Um, I think if you can get into the schools, because that's where they are, uh, then you have a better chance of drawing a crowd. Um, Mm -hmm. Word of mouth is huge um, because parents talk to parents. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And the younger they are, especially, I mean, it's difficult um, that teen parents don't connect as much. Right. Um, It's, it's just a weird thing, but it is true. And it's because it's, it's kind of hard to talk about some of the stuff that your teen is doing. Um, you feel uncomfortable with it. You feel embarrassed, maybe um, that kind of thing. You feel vulnerable, you know, because the kind of range of what they can get into in terms of trouble and mental health stuff goes up and it's scary and you don't necessarily want to share that with your neighbor um, or your friend kind of thing. But um, word of mouth is huge. So parents do talk to each other. Um, so, I mean, if you can get into the schools in your neighborhood and find a key person there, like connect with uh, a counselor there or the guidance counselor or the principal or, um, gosh, I mean, you know, the best people in the schools are the office staff. Right. The ones that check the parents in and are friendly and have those conversations. And, you know, so there's just that quick, I'm, um, you know, signing in to go into my kid's classroom. You know, he's really struggling and... Um, I want to be here more. And they're like, you know, the office staff's like, hmm, it's funny you said that because I just heard about this yoga thing that is for stress for your right. teens or your tween. Um, so if you can get in with key people, yeah, that's good. But also uh, talking to parents, any parents that you can get access to um, because word of mouth is huge. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. And you said that you do a kid's camp then as well. What does that it's look like? It's tween and teen camp. This is a riot. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite things. I look forward to it all year long. Um, every summer for eight weeks. So it's four weeks in June, four weeks in July. Um, I run a camp. It's uh, the tweens, the nine to 12 year olds. It's on Wednesdays from one fifteen to four fifteen, And then the teens, what I call the teens, which, and, and here I just do it a little different. It's for 11 to 14 year olds, um, because 11 and 12 are my most popular ages. So I really need to have more space for them. And, uh, we do, it's a three hour camp. We do 60 minutes of yoga and then two hours to do a really cool yoga related craft. So for instance, last week we painted mandalas, um, or we uh, drew mandalas and well, one group painted, one group did Sharpies, but, um, you know, and talked about the symbolism of uh, wholeness and unity, 
you know, the mandala. And then this week we're making Zen sandboxes. We got these little wood boxes and uh, they're like flat and square and we paint them and we put sand in them and we make these little wooden rakes and just very simple decorations in there. Maybe we um, put a rock in there that says peace or calm or something. And they can just draw on the sand with their rakes. Oh, wow. So just really fun that. stuff. Um, and they sell out. They uh, This is needed. So if anybody out there is listening and wants to start something like this, you will have a crew. Um, mine are over full right now. Um, no one else in my area is doing anything like this. We have uh, yoga in the park here in the summer, which I, I think those things pop up. Um, which I think is another great idea as far as marketing. If um, if there are parks available, you know, contacting the um, whoever manages the parks. The here it's the Metro District, I think is what it's called, um, and trying to offer yoga in the park. Um, you know, just as a space and being outside in nature is a lovely place to do yoga. But other than that, there's just not too much going on. So these camps are huge, and they're so fun. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you have any resources that you would suggest for yoga teachers who are interested in teaching teens and say they want books or um, online resources or trainings? Do you have anything that you suggest? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, kid yoga trainings around. Um, I think the trainings tend to focus on uh, the younger mm-hmm. kids. They like do. I said, I offered a workshop on how to teach kids, tweens, and teens, and I'll continue to do that. Is that workshop online or in person that you offer? It's in person. Again, I have a space. I mean, I'm really in a luxury position to have people come to me and I'll get another one up there because I do want it to, um, we need this. We need more people doing this and thinking like this and um, approaching youth. But I think as far as books, um, so this is not a yoga resource, but, um, it's a teenage resource that it's one where, you know, how you have your favorite thing that you just wish everybody would read. I wish everybody would read Daniel Siegel's brainstorm. It's a book about the teenage brain and it's genius. And it answers so many questions for parents, for, um, anybody working with teenagers to just really understand. So Daniel Siegel, the brain, uh, brainstorm. And he has TED Talks. He's got videos and stuff. He's just, it, it makes it so relatable to what's happening. And when you understand your audience, when you understand who your student is on that level, I think you just have a better chance of connecting with them and offering yoga in a way that's going to be very relatable to them, that's going to be very developmentally appropriate for them. And so I know it's not a yoga resource, but it's a teen resource. That sounds amazing. There's not a day that I don't work with a parent that I'm like, will you please read this and then come back (laughs) and then we'll talk. Okay. Like have that as your base and then I'll talk to you about your child. Right. Oh, that's so good. You're the second person that has told me about this book. So I feel like this would be a good read if I am feeling the frustrations. I feel like my, I always tell my, my son, who's the oldest, the 21 year old, like, I feel like I made a lot of the mistakes with you. I didn't really know what I was in for. And now the other two, it's a little easier. <laughs> Good to have a practice child. I don't yeah. think they feel that way, but it's nice for us. <laughs> yeah. He's always like, mom, I feel like they're, you know, they're being rude or they're, they're doing this or, you know, they're doing this. I'm like, yeah, you did it too. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's going to turn around. Thank you so much for this. If people want to find out more, maybe get in touch with you and find out how they can either sign up for a workshop or maybe a mentorship call with you, how do they do that? They can contact me through my website. And so it's mindbodylifetc.com. And when I have workshops available, they would be probably posted on my Facebook page. You can link into the schedule from there and find out anything that's going on at my studio. And on Facebook, it's Mind Body Life TC. Okay, perfect. Is there anything that really stands out, a story that stands out for you lately of the impact that teen yoga can have? And maybe we don't always see the impact. It's not recent, but it's just one of my favorites and it's it's common. This is one thing. I already mentioned this strategy called the breath of joy, mm-hmm. which it's so clearing of negative stuck 
stagnant, down energy. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't even saying this to me. She was saying this into the room to the other students. And I was kind of walking in and we were getting ready to start. And I heard her saying that, you say this like this, I've never heard this before, but about friends, like my friend broke up with me. And this is a friend that a friend had been mean to her. And so they didn't want to be friends anymore. And so she was 10. And she said, but then I just went out at recess and I did the breath of joy and I was fine. Oh, (laughs) that's adorable. You know, that kind of thing. Right. I'm going to remember that. The next time I have tech issues, I'm going to try the breath of joy. (laughs) Yes. And I've had interesting thing, Nadi Shodana, you know, the alternate nostril breath. Yeah. I teach that to a lot of teens that report to me perseverating thoughts. Like they get stuck on thoughts and they can't let them go. Like something happened. They felt bad about it. They didn't like what they said and they can't stop thinking about that. And I teach them Nadi Shodana and they love it. And I'm always a little uncomfortable to teach it because, you know, you use your hand and it's manual and you're touching your nose and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's a little bit awkward. They love it. And so they often say, you know, and I get feedback, I go, okay, so what are the yoga are you using? What's working for you? Uh, oh, the alternate nostril breathing. Wow. Time, I do that every day. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, you're making a big impact. I'm just thinking that if we all kind of learn these little coping tools, yes, you know, our listeners, most of them all do yoga and have fallen in love with it. That's why they teach it. There's a lot of the population that doesn't know about these tools. So thank you. Yeah. So please teachers out there, spread it around. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Well, connected yoga teachers, I want to hear from you. What was your key takeaway? Are you feeling inspired to teach to this age group? Or are you thinking, no way, Not my niche, but it was fun to learn how this is different from children's yoga and adult yoga. If you are a yoga teacher who is teaching to teens and tweens, I would love to hear from you either in the comments of our show notes page or tag me on social media. Tag Shannon Crow Yoga or the Connected Yoga Teacher. You can look for either one. And if you are in our Facebook group for Connected Yoga Teachers, tell us about what you thought of this episode and how you bring yoga to teens and tweens. I think this is such important work and I know that we're not all cut out for it. And that's the amazing thing about niching down and finding your niche. What a difference we can make with this age group that will really ripple out into the population of our community. One key takeaway for me is that I want to read this book, Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain by Daniel J. Siegel. If you are looking to hang out before our next episode, Connected Yoga Teachers, there are lots of ways to do that. There are online free trainings. There are ways to work with me. If you go to the connectedyogateacher.com, look under work with me if you want to work one-on-one Look under trainings and events if you're interested in learning about prenatal yoga, yoga for pelvic health, the koshas, how to create content, and many other things. I want to send a huge thank you to our team over here at The Connected Yoga Teacher. They do so much to make these episodes possible and their work means so much to me. Also, thank you, dear listener, for showing up and being here and hanging out And I want to know, what will you be doing this week to stay connected? Is there some way that you can stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice, or to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up? 